Grace is yours and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God serving as our text, our Gospel reading from John chapter 4, verses 5 through 30. In Christ Jesus, who came to seek and save those who are lost, dear fellow redeemed, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Those words of the Apostle Peter were ringing in my ear as we visited with Charlie, the cab driver. Cindy and I spent two hours with him. He was a friendly fellow, talkative too. He told us about his childhood, his previous employment, his aging mother, his six children. He expressed his concern about the cost of health care and education and the state of the economy. And some point in there he said, you know, people say I talk too much. If I'm talking too much, you just have to say so. We wouldn't have dreamed of it. But suddenly the conversation flipped as Charlie said to me, so what do you do? I looked over at my wife, who had the slightest hint of a smile forming on her face. I could read her thoughts. She was telling herself, oh boy, if Charlie thinks he talks a lot, (laughs) wait till this guy gets going. Which is normally true. But at that moment in time, I found myself searching for words. Because it was an opportunity to talk, not about me, but about our Savior. So I started wondering, just exactly what should I say to Charlie? How should I say it? How will he receive it? I'm guessing you have thoughts like that now and again. And if you do, you and I have brought those questions and thoughts to the right place this morning. Because Jesus gives us some answers here in John chapter 4. We'll find in his words the disciple's guide to sharing Christ. That's what John presents to us here in a few short paragraphs. He holds before our eyes our Savior and reminds us that he is the God-man. God's Son from all eternity who stepped into time and took on human flesh and blood and did it with one purpose in mind to save all of us sinners from our sins. As one who is fully human, a long day's journey on foot left Jesus tired and hungry and thirsty. We have a Savior who can relate to us and our needs. And what is more, doesn't try to hide it. He's not ashamed of it. In fact, he uses it to meet people where they're at. Jesus' weariness has brought him to a well in Samaria, a place his countrymen would describe as enemy territory, but not Jesus. Oh, he's well aware of the rift between the Samaritans and his people, the Jews, but Jesus has come to save the lost of all nations. He's come to a well as the all-knowing Son of God. He knows he's about to have company, a Samaritan woman who should be arriving right about now. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Think of it. The one through whom all things are made, including every river and every stream, humbles himself to beg this woman for a drink. She replies, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In meeting this woman where she's at, Jesus uses a need that they both have the need for water. 
And with it, he steers the conversation in a spiritual direction. The woman's curiosity is piqued. She understands, at least in part, at least enough to know that Jesus couldn't possibly be offering to fetch her water from the well in front of them because he doesn't even have a bucket. So what's he saying? Is he telling her that he's going to give her water that's better than the water from this well that's been serving her and her people going all the way back to the days of the great patriarch Jacob? Well, yes, that's exactly what he's saying. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. A moment ago, he's begging water. Now he's offering the greatest gift ever, the living water of his gospel, so powerful, so wonderful, that it quenches a thirsty soul forever. But the offer is lost on the woman. Maybe you can understand why. Her heart and mind are so bogged down with the troubles and challenges of everyday life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Translation, Man, if you really want to help me, you'll fix it so that I don't have to lug water from this well every day. I'm wearing myself out. I say, I I think you can relate to that. How often we have similar feelings about life, about Jesus. Sickness comes, the bills pile up, work gets harder, family strife increases, the worry about all these things and more consumes us. And we convince ourselves that if Jesus really wants to help us, he just needs to make it all go away. He just needs to wave his hand and fix our lives. Then we'd have something to tell our friends and neighbors, right? I mean, can you imagine if I could have told Charlie, the cab driver that day, that Jesus would cover the cost of health care and his children's education, how grateful he would have been for that conversation? But as it was, I could promise no such thing. I could tell him, though, of a greater debt, one that Jesus did cancel completely with his lifeblood as the price. But to do that, I'd need to refocus the conversation on life's biggest problem, the underlying cause to all the troubles and challenges every day. This is what Jesus does so masterfully in the disciples' guide to sharing Christ. He speaks the truth in love to the woman at the well, and to all of us. She just told Jesus that the best thing he could ever do for her would be to unburden her of those daily trips to the well. Jesus' response may sound a bit odd. He told her, go, call your husband, and come back. At first blush, it seems like Jesus simply wants to to grow his audience, at least by one. But there's more going on here. Jesus means to show this woman that she's carrying around a burden far heavier than any jug of water. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. The all-knowing Son of God is completely aware of what's going on in her life, as he is of our lives. He doesn't give us all the details of this woman's past. He doesn't need to. He tells us just enough to understand that this is a sinful woman who's living in a sinful relationship with a man to whom she's not married. And you and I can imagine that that sin has made her an outcast from her community. But more to the point, her sin has separated her from God. We know that for a fact. 
Because that's what sin does, always. And that is something so important for you and I to keep in mind as we speak to people about Jesus. We know their great need because we know that they are like us, sinners. People who have inherited the sinful condition from their parents. And we know something else. We know that the sinful nature of ours shows itself in sinful words and actions many ways, many times, every day, day after day. Have you seen those commercials that mean to illustrate our growing national debt? They have that large numerical clock on the screen spinning out of control with our nation's debt. Well, that's the way it is with our sin debt before God as it grows and grows and as it grows, the burden of guilt gets heavier and heavier so that people come to the conclusion that the troubles and problems they're having in life come from an angry God. And he's just warming up because soon he will mete out the worst punishment of them all, an eternity of misery in hell. Of course, there are some pretty loud voices out there that dismiss that as nonsense. These are people who are busy trying to get rid of guilt, and they're doing it by telling us that there really isn't such a thing as sin. Everything is permissible in their book. But you know what? It's not working. They're not fooling anyone, not even themselves, because no matter how hard they try, they're not able to silence or shout down the voice of their own conscience. Nor can they deny that sin's wage of death is busy demanding payment all around them. They understand that one day their bill will come due. So don't be fooled by what they say. These are the kinds of thoughts that are weighing heavily on their hearts and minds. Sin is the great elephant in the room. Talking about it is not unloving. In fact, it's a subject that you and I can speak to with some authority, can't we? As fellow sinners. It's part of meeting people where they're at. We can relate. We've been there. We know the hurts and heartaches caused by sin. Our sin. The sins of the people around us. We can speak to these things. We can speak the truth about sin and guilt. And do it in a way that shows compassion and understanding. But of course, that's not where our conversation is going to end. Because we know so much more. We know the one who has taken sin's burden to himself. The one who's canceled all the sin debt by stepping in and paying sin's wage in our place. We know Jesus. We know his message of pardon and peace. And from the disciples' guide to sharing Christ, we know how important it is to stay on message. Jesus has just explained to this woman that her heaviest burden is the burden of her sin and its guilt. She replies, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I read in her words an attempt to get rid of the guilt. Here's a woman looking for a place to make things right with God. Others see in her words an attempt to change the subject, to go into some details of religion that maybe don't have to poke around her sin. Either way, I'm reminded how easily spiritual conversations can become religious debates and arguments, which serves no purpose, certainly not the Savior's purpose. Look at how loving and patient Jesus is with this woman. She wants to know who's got the better religion. Jesus lays out for her the fact that it has always been God's loving plan to bring the Savior into the world through the Jewish nation. He tells her those ceremonies and sacrifices at the temple, those are placed there by God himself. He used them as a picture to show how Messiah would work and what he would accomplish with his sacrifice. But then most important of all, Jesus tells this woman that now that God's anointed, the Christ, has actually come into the world, 
these ceremonies and sacrifices will no longer be necessary. Jesus tells her, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. God isn't some vague force in the universe that is honored by some kind of formal mechanical worship. He's a spiritual being who takes interest and is involved in the lives of the people he's created. So much so that he was willing to become one of us. To live and die in our place as our substitute and then rise as our champion over sin and death. Jesus is worshipped when we embrace this truth by faith with all our heart and mind and soul. He's worshipped as we proclaim this champion of ours to others, trusting that God will be at work in our witness, creating faith when and where it pleases Him in His grace. This is key to worshiping Jesus in our conversations, to understand the relationship we have with Him and how we serve Him. Jesus hasn't set quotas for you and me as if we're some kind of spiritual sales force sent out to do the hard pressure sale. He happily rules our hearts and lives in His grace. And in that grace pardons us daily all of our sins, including our sin, to fail to share Him with others. He's not keeping track. He's not angry with us. He's not looking to get even or punish us in some way. He's taken all our sin away. Instead of blaming us, he credits us with the record of his own perfect love. So that as God sees it, you and I are the ones at Jacob's well, sharing life-giving water with a sin-parched soul. We get the credit for that. And we share the joy of watching a fellow sinner so thrilled with the peace she has in Christ that she can't wait to pass it along to others. She leaves the jug at the well. That's the only reason she had come there. But now the jug stays at the well and she races back to town. What an example for us, huh? Reminding us that you don't have to be a seminary professor or even a longtime Christian to share Jesus with others. You can simply say what he's done for you. And then invite others like she invited her townspeople. Come see. Come see for yourself. The invitation wasn't lost on those people. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I had a similar experience with Charlie. I was so grateful for our conversation. I think he was too. We talked about Jesus. About his love and what it means to us here and hereafter. That's something we can do. Every day. Think about the people that God places in your life. Stop and pray for them. Pray for yourself that God would give you an opportunity to share his word with them. And then when the opportunity comes, pray for some boldness. Ask God to just let you speak what it is that he has done for you in Christ. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors what Jesus' peace means to you as you face the troubles and problems of life. And better yet, tell them what that peace means as you look forward to a life without troubles and problems, the life that awaits you and all who believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to